Excuse me, I forgot to turn on my gizmo here. There we go. Uh, I, I've spent some time doing some research into the history uh, of our congregation, which has been around about as long as yours has. And uh, it's been really cool to see the connections between uh, Calvary Baptist and uh, First Baptist in Port Hope. And, and we have a lot of history that we share. And uh, someday I'm going to write a book. And uh, that'll be cool. Now, I have been uh, a worship leader for Mumble Mumble many years. And being a worship leader entails, uh, you know, leading congregations in prayer, choosing songs uh, and prayers and scriptures that we will sing and read together to, uh, to help us in our, our gathered worship to, to focus on and to hear from uh, the God who we serve. And over the years, it has very much been the case that it's my favorite kind of service when it's a communion service. As Ray said, you guys will be celebrating that next Sunday. But communion services, uh, when we, we share the bread and we share the cup in remembrance of Jesus, those are my favorite services. As a worship leader, they're my favorite services just for the music. Because throughout the history of the church, there's a tremendous, wonderful body of powerful, rich music that has been written around the idea of Christ's death and resurrection. Um, those songs and musical pieces are among the most creative and the most lyrical and the most skilled, beautiful music. As a believer, as someone who just follows Jesus to the best of my ability. Um, I love communion services because they help to bring me back. They help to bring me back to where my faith began at the cross. And as a teacher, I love communion services and those scriptures that, um, that were written around those events of those days, those hours, those people and how everybody responded and everything that people said and, and what happened next. And uh, there's so much there that is just theologically rich and humanly relatable and personally challenging. And today, um, I want to start by us reading together from the screen a passage that I'm sure will be familiar to you um, that is read in conjunction with communion services. So can we, can we speak these words together? For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. There are probably people in this room who have that passage memorized simply because you've heard them so many times. Because these words written by uh, the Apostle Paul, are spoken by pastors around the world and Sunday after Sunday and in many languages and many traditions by millions of people sharing communion because these words are powerful. They are important and they are unifying. Earlier this year, I was planning uh, the worship for a Good Friday service in Port Hope and this idea of remembrance really jumped out off the page at me. You know how the Bible does that sometimes. Every now and then you'll be reading something you've read a million times before and suddenly something just goes, pow, where did that come from? Which is awesome. This passage, this writing of the Apostle Paul, he is emphasizing the idea of remembrance. Remembering Jesus. And I find that really interesting for a few different reasons. First of all, Paul is writing about uh, event, an event where he wasn't there. He wasn't in the room when this happened. So, you know, he personally can't remember what happened. 
But he is urging us, who were not there, to remember. And I find that kind of interesting. And because Paul wasn't there, he's drawing from other sources. And the one source that we can identify is Luke. Uh, Luke is one of the gospel writers, and that's where we find the idea of remembrance connected to the Last Supper, which is the second thing that I find interesting, and that is that the other gospels don't make that connection. The other gospel writers don't connect the idea of remembering to the Last Supper. Their focus is on other things that are going on, other important ideas, but not specific, specifically remembrance, excuse me. And the other thing that's interesting is that Luke himself only quotes Jesus as talking about remembrance once in conjunction with the bread. He does not quote Jesus saying it in conjunction with the cup. So what's happening here, as best I can understand it, is that Paul is recognizing something in Luke's writing that is really, really important and really, really big. And Paul is expanding on it, and he's running with it, and he's turning it into something that we can recognize and use as a liturgy in our worship together. A liturgy is an established formula. It's a set of words or actions that, that we can follow like a trail of breadcrumbs to help us to walk together through truth. So as I was planning that Good Friday service, the question that struck me was, well, why? Why was this idea of remembering so important for the Apostle Paul? I find when I sing wearing a mask, I get thirsty. So uh, when you do a word search um, for the word remembering um, in, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, what I found was uh, that most of the remembering that happens in the Bible is the kind of remembering that is very relatable to us. It's the kind of thing where we bring back to the present tense, bring back to the front of our mind something from the past. Uh, something that somebody said, something something happened, um, a person that, that because of uh, distraction, because of the passing of time, has sort of slipped out of view into the back of our mind, sort of, you know, down between the cushions. And we have to kind of dig down and, and find it. And we go, oh, look, I found it. There it is. And it's in the front of our mind again. And in the context of communion, that kind of remembering is, is really, really appropriate. Um, it is entirely right and good for us to bring back to the front of our minds the fact that Jesus willingly suffered. He willingly died and came back to share with us the power of resurrection and of eternal hope and of new life. It's the kind of remembering that um, my friends and I did last Saturday when we got together to remember our friend, Ian. Ian, um, Ian was killed uh, a little while ago. So we got together to, uh, to celebrate his life to share our memories, to share our stories, to share the good times, to remember the hard times, and to, to just see his face one more time together, and to hear in each other, to hear his voice again, and to remember him, and to bring him back among us again. And that is a beautifully human way to remember. When a family of believers come together at this table in an intentional and heartfelt way, it is a, a, the most beautiful exercise that a faith family can undertake to just cherish the shared memory of someone who means that much to us. But there's another kind of remembering in the Bible, and that's what I would like to focus on this morning. In the passage that, uh, that Ray read for us this morning from Exodus chapter 20, 
God expresses this kind of remembering, I think, in a very effective way. And he says, remember the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath. God is commanding his people as part of his covenant, as part of their relationship together, as part of the journey that they're going to be going on uh, that is fairly new when these words are spoken. God is expressing this idea of remembering the Sabbath. The Sabbath was the last day of the week. It was set aside as special. People were not to work. You work six days, you rest on the Sabbath. And the Sabbath became a tremendously important, central, unique covenant characteristic of Israel. It was a part of their individual identities. It was a part of their corporate and national identity. And they took it so seriously that this huge body of teaching rose up over the centuries about how to remember the Sabbath and those ideas of don't work. It sounds simple, but what does that mean? And uh, I did a little bit of research on this, and it's, it's kind of amazing. Um, there are 39 identified categories of work that are to be avoided on the Sabbath. I have a list of a few of them here. The first one is carrying, and then it goes on to burning, extinguishing, finishing, writing, erasing, cooking, washing, sewing, and all the women said, amen. Tearing, <clears throat> tearing, tying, untying, shaping, plowing, planting, reaping, and it goes on um, up to number 39. And uh, I, I found this quote online on a, a website called OU, which I believe stands for Orthodoxy Union, uh, I think, .org. And just as an aside, this is just kind of a really cool insight into the observance of Sabbath and what it means. The definition of such work is an, any act where man demonstrates his mastery over nature. But the first act by which man demonstrates such mastery is taking things from nature and carrying them where he needs them. In a sense, by not carrying, we also relinquish our ownership of everything in the world. A main sign of ownership is that we may take something where we please. On the Sabbath, we give up something of this ownership and nothing may be removed from the house. When a man leaves his house, he may carry nothing but the clothing on his back. It is God, not man, who owns all things. This is the kind of depth and sincerity and, and integrity that goes into an understanding of observing, remembering Sabbath. For the purposes of our talk this morning, what I find the most important, what I find the most significant is that I would argue that by remembering Sabbath, Israel made Sabbath happen. By remembering Sabbath, Israel became something new. Israel created what would become Sabbath. By remembering Sabbath, they carved out space among themselves and among the nations around them, and they created a footprint where eternity could stand. That idea of remembering Sabbath is consistent with what it means when God himself remembers. There are a few places in scripture where we are told then God remembered. Now, God doesn't, you know, forget the way we do. He doesn't have those couch cushions in the back of his head where he has to go rummaging for stuff because it's got to be there somewhere. And, you know, I can't drive the car without the keys, so I got to go down behind those cushions and find those memories and figure out what I need to remember. That's not how God's mind works. When God remembers in scripture. That is an indication that something is about to happen. When God remembers, the world gets changed. 
In Genesis chapter 8, God remembered Noah. And in that moment, the destructive floodwaters began to recede. And it was the beginning of the beginning of a new beginning. In Genesis chapter 18, God remembers Abraham and Lot is saved from the destruction of Sodom. In Genesis 8, no, Genesis 30, God remembers Rachel. In 1 Samuel, God remembers Hannah and these women who had been unable to conceive a child give birth to children who become men who for centuries affect the destiny of their people. In Judges 16, God is asked by Samson, please remember me. And for that moment, Samson's strength returns and God's enemies fall. In Exodus chapter 2, God remembers Abraham and Jacob and Israel. And he begins to open the door for Israel to be freed, to become a nation. In Luke chapter 23, my favorite, God remembers a dying thief hanging on the cross beside him. And that dying thief is forgiven and embraced into an eternity of life today with me in paradise. When God remembers, things happen. When God remembers, the world is changed. Yesterday, Paul and I were talking uh, about this morning, and uh, he asked me, uh, do you have a so what? And when, we, when we're talking about that, and either of us is preaching somewhere, it's like, okay, so what's, what's the so what? And the so what is the moment in the sermon when the, the speaker sort of ties together the loose ends and helps get a big picture understanding of what we've been talking about and says, this is an appropriate way to respond. This is something that we need to do in response. This is the so what. But this morning, I don't so much have a so what as a what if. This is not the kind of thing where the loose ends neatly connect. It's the kind of thing where we can debate and discuss and go on to, to ask questions and to look things up and, you know, go for it. But this study of the idea of remembering leaves me with a question, not with an answer. It is a question that I am not in a position to answer or to try to answer, but it is one that I will humbly ask myself more than anyone else. And my question is this. What if Paul, who understood the Old Covenant, who understood Sabbath and its impact on the consciousness of the nation of Israel, Paul, who was a highly educated Jewish scholar and zealous for the God of Israel, what if Paul, who understood who Jesus was, even though they never met in the flesh, but who came to an understanding of who Jesus was, that he was in very nature God, who chose to humble himself, but who will ultimately be raised up when we acknowledge that he is Lord. What if, when Paul encountered those words of Jesus, remember me, what if the voice that Paul heard saying that phrase was not simply the voice of a man who is leaving his friends behind and wants to not be forgotten, a human being who wants to be remembered the way we remembered our friend Ian. What if, in addition to that human voice, Paul also heard the voice of Yahweh in the voice of Israel's history of covenant? What if Paul heard an echo in those words of a Sabbath kind of remembering? The kind of remembering that becomes a unique, indelible characteristic 
of Christ's church on earth. The kind of remembering that is an inseparable part of our individual and corporate identities. A kind of remembering that carves out space among us and among the nation around us, carving out a footprint where eternity can stand. What if by taking that one mention in the writing of Luke and turning it into something greater for us all to share, what if Paul is pointing us towards a remembrance of Jesus the Christ, the Lord, the kind of remembrance that makes things happen? The kind of remembrance that changes the world. In John chapter 14, the Apostle John writes uh, a record of Jesus' final sermon, his final message to his followers, which includes us. John records Jesus commanding them, believe in God, believe, believe in God. If you can't believe in God because of what I've said, believe because of what I've done. John quotes Jesus as saying, trust that there is a place prepared for you and that you will see me again there. Jesus said, if you love me, obey me. Don't look to the world for your approval because you're not going to find it there. Find your identity in me. Jesus says, live in the peace that I leave, the peace that no one can take away. Jesus said, you are not slaves anymore. I chose you. You will have suffering, but I have conquered. This is the Jesus who commands us to remember him. He is commanding us to live him into the world, to act, to speak, to live him, to share him, to give him, to forgive the way he forgave to be perfect as he is perfect, to love as he loved, to serve as he served, to take up the cross as he took up the cross, to be one as he and the Father were one. This is the Jesus we are commanded to remember, and I would argue, to remember in a way that changes the world. So my question is, what if he is calling us to remember as God remembers? To make things happen, to change the world. And what if we actually did. Can you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we, we approach the scriptures sometimes a little too lightly and sometimes a little too fear and trembling. We thank you for the truth that you've shared with us by leaving these written words behind so that we can follow that trail of breadcrumbs to the truth. We thank you for the opportunity that you give us to remember, to just be reminded in the front of our mind of who you are and what you've done and why that matters. And we thank you for the way in which you remember us. When you remember us, things happen and the world changes. God, I pray that you would give us, that you would give me wisdom to know how to walk that path, how to find that remembrance in everyday life, and to make the world more your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.